couple weeks ago, Pastor Michelle and I got to go to uh, Maui, Hawaii. Now you guys know how much we love Hawaii, right? Yeah. Talk about us, see? Yeah? Okay. So we met this amazing couple, Pastor Chris and Stacy, who are here with us today. And uh, it's almost like we walked into his place, right? Because it just felt the same. It was just called God's house. And you know a pastor likes another pastor's church when he rocks his, his church shirt, right? Yeah. And it, just, it just flipped. It's just like the same. And uh, we, we're just blessed that they're in town this weekend. And Pastor Chris is going to, um, well, be careful with the roof today, okay? <laughs> Put your seatbelts on. Get ready for a radical ride with Jesus. Because my friend, my brother, my, my, my guy who I just love the hell out of is going to come and give it to us now, right? So give him a big his place. <laughs> How are you guys doing today? Hey. I've never preached out of a pink mic before, so this is going to be awesome. All right. All right. Where's my Asians at? Yeah, I heard there was an Asian invasion today. It's going to be a good day. I want you to turn to the person next to you, and I want you to say, well, it's about to be on today. And I want you to turn to the other person on the other side, and I want you to say, yo, Jesus. Jesus. Yes. Man, I'm so glad to be here with you guys. I love Tommy and Michelle. Pastors Tommy and Michelle, they're amazing. You guys are blessed to have awesome pastors. I mean, it, it's, it's an amazing thing when, when, a, when an Asian dude can, can just bond instantly with a dude that looks like Paul Bunyan. And, and it's, all, it's all gorgeous. It's like amazing. You know, it's like my brother from another mother. We got like the same hairdo. It's kind of incredible, right? And uh, I'm very jealous of his beard. Like I, I could, you know, if I, if I, if God ever granted me the miracle of having a beard like his, I would never shave it. I'll be like Samson. i will be like the source of my strength. Like it'd be the source of my strength. It'd be, it'd be so amazing, right? It is such an honor to be here with you guys, being out here in California and being here at his place. I love being at places that I believe are gonna be little sprouts of revival, wherever you are. And I believe that God is raising up places all over the United States in which he's going to bring his revival. Yeah. That I believe that God is done playing church. Yeah. I think that God is done going to church. I believe that God is done doing church, acting like church, dressing like church, talking like church. And I think that what he's looking for is a generation of people who are genuinely, authentically obsessed with the idea that Jesus loves every person on earth radically and unconditionally and wants to be able to be a conduit of living water, spreading his love to every person and watch the love of God break every chain, destroy every stronghold, set every captive free, break your insecurity, break your depression, break drugs, alcohol, everything that comes between people and him. And I, I think, I don't think, I know, that his place is one of those places. Amen. He's with you. Man. It's going to be on today. It's going to be on today. I got a lot to go with today, so get ready. We're going to have fun. We're going to laugh. We're going to cry. We're going to jump, whatever. We're going to shout. And you can you can yell back at me. I'm not somebody who preaches for reaction, but I'm just going to warn you. If you yell at me and get crazy at me, because I'm going to get crazy up here in a second. If you get crazy with me, then we may not leave today. You may not make it to lunch. So I'm just telling you right now. Let's get crazy. So if you get hungry, if you're hungry, the best thing you can do is be really, really quiet. <laughs> but, but if you don't mind, if you don't mind missing out on in and out today, it's cool. Alright? It's, it's cool. Just, just yell at me. Just shout. Just laugh. Just have a good time. Alright? Smile at me. Alright? Smile at me. We're cool? We're good? You understand the ground rules? Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. I grew up in church my whole life. I'm a Maui boy through and through. I got my Kahului Elementary School, Maui Waiana Intermediate, Maui High School, card-carrying Maui boy. Born and raised. And at 15 years old, after having grown up in church my whole life, I came to know Jesus Christ at 11 o'clock at night, sitting outside the front steps of my parents' church. And I thought that there was something that was incredibly wrong with the fact that I got saved at 11 o'clock at night 
sitting outside the locked doors of the church that I entered every single week for 15 years and never met him. That I learned that I had, you can go to church and you can learn all about Jesus, but you don't have to really know Jesus. Yeah. Come on, say that right yeah. there. And there's a problem with that. And we've created a culture in which it's, it's okay to know about Jesus, but it's a little bit shameful to actually know him. So we hide him. And we made it okay for us to come to church and we can have services where we can sing songs, preach messages, and we can do things whether Jesus shows up or not and go home unchanged, ineffective in our world. And we're just going to hold on till Jesus comes. And that's Christianity. And I believe that God is doing something completely different. And so I came to know Jesus at 15 years old. And I graduated high school at 16. I, was, I went to my senior year. And, and God called me into the ministry. I said, who's going to tell people about you? Who's going to introduce people to you? And he said, you are. That's why, that's why I chose you. And I was just nobody kid in high school. I mean, nobody knew who I was. I was nerdy. I, I, I mean, I was in the eighth grade. And I was like four foot nine. And, I, and my parents, I, had, I grew up in this traditional Asian family. And my parents had like a contract out of my life in, in, in high school. They, they cut my hair with this China bowl haircut. Like they literally put the bowl on my head and like just cut it. And it was just brown. And then I had these big, thick, gray glasses, which is kind of ironic because I have big, thick, black glasses now. But it was before it was cool, right? It was before it was hip. And, and I had these big, thick, gray glasses. And then I had braces. And then I had that headgear that went around your head. And I went to school like that. Yeah, yeah, y'all laughing. Y'all laughing. Yeah, it was, it was, yeah, yeah, it was, it was, I can laugh about it now, but I'm crying inside. Y'all just But it was, it was horrible growing up. I got picked on a lot, and I, I, I just didn't have any voice whatsoever. I didn't think I was anybody. And when it came to Christ, I didn't come to him because I really wanted to know him. I came to him as a last, last ditch effort because I was tired of life. I was done with life. I said, man, God, if you don't do something right here at 11 o'clock at night on these steps, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life. I don't know if if it's even worth living. And I encountered Jesus Christ that night. One day, maybe I'll tell you the whole story. Like, I got a word for you today, so I got to get to it. I just want to give you a little bit of history as to why Jesus and what I'm about to preach means so much to me. Since that time, God has given me the amazing, amazing privilege to speak all over the world in front of tens of thousands of people at a time. And I'm this little Maui boy that nobody knew in high school. Now, I'm the pastor of some of the coolest kids that I grew up in high school with. And I'm their pastor. Awesome. Yeah, great. It's a testimony. Well, I went to Bible college, and I thought, you know what? I'm going to go to Bible college, and it's going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome because I'm going to learn all about I'm going to go to where, like, where, where God is moving in, 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 all, in the mainland, all over the, the U.S. I'm going to go, and just, I'm going to get, like, just radically encounter God. And I remember going that first weekend I was in college, in Bible college, in this, in this Bible college north of Atlanta, Georgia. And because I went as far as I could to get away from all my friends. That's a whole other story. And that opening weekend, they bring in speakers, and they have this big revival kind of camp meeting kind of thing for, for uh, the weekend. And I had never seen anything like that because I'm this Maui boy. This little Maui boy grew up in a small church. And there's thousands of people there, all my age. And the guy preaches, and he preaches this amazing message about giving your all to God, giving your heart to Christ, and, and being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And, and when he gave the altar call, me and, and, uh, and hundreds of kids came up, and we just we just were all over, and the atmosphere was incredible. It was just charged, and we were just packed in there like sardines in the front. And and I, I stood there, and I was waiting, and you know, and you know, when you go to an altar call, you want to make sure. By the way, I'm going to give you a disclaimer real quick. If you're really religious, you're going to be really mad at me in about 10 minutes. <laughs> And I'm going to make fun of a whole lot of stuff, all right? So, you just need to know. But I have a feeling from the way you're pastors, you guys are going to be just cool with it, right? Just yeah, cool with it. Amen. So, you know when you go up to the altar call, and there's a lot of people at the altar call, you got to kind of guess which side the pastor is going to start praying for people on, because you don't want to be on the end, right? Because by then, you've waited like 45 minutes, right? Your legs hurt. 
right? And, and, and now you're like the last person up there. So everybody's kind of mad at you that you're still up there, right? So you want to kind of gauge which side he's going to start on. Well, I was wrong. I started on the wrong side. And I'm standing there for what's felt like forever. And then I'm waiting there. And I'm like this. And I'm like, when is he going to come? And so I look over. And then I go back. And then I do a double take because when I looked over, he's putting his hands on people and people are just falling down. Yeah. <laughs> and I look and I'm like this. <laughs> and all of, all of a sudden, I go from trying to get closer to him to trying to get farther away. Like, you go first, you go first, you go first, right? And I'm at the end. Finally, he gets to me and he comes and he just, he comes in his hand and he grabs me and squeezes my brain. And he pushes and he goes, receive the Holy Spirit. And that fight reflex in me just put my head down and I'm like, I ain't going down for nobody, you know? And, and so, he start, so he start pushing harder on my head. So I start pushing harder with my head, right? And I'm, I'm like half Japanese. Japanese are like the most hard-headed people in the world. So it's like, I'm like, dude, I, I got this, you know? And then he's squeezing my brain and we're like, we're like here, you know? And then everybody, you know, the, the keyboard player's playing and it's like the, the keyboard just pauses on that one note. It's like, uh, <laughs> and everything goes in slow motion. It's this cosmic battle between good and evil, creature and 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 the and the person at the altar, and just like everything kind of freezes. And, and you know, I brace my leg back because I'm I'm getting leverage, and I'm like pushing forward on him, and he's like receive the Holy Spirit. And then he does the thing that preachers do. That really, it's just like their trump card. He 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 lifts his elbow and he goes like this. And then that's it. You're done. Like, you're done. I was done. He pushed down and my legs started shaking, feel bad. And I was like, I'm done. I'm done. I'm this small little Asian guy. And I'm like, okay, he's got me. He's got me. He's going through the move, right? I got, he's got me. So I'm like, I'm going to go down. I'm going to go down. So I do what, what you always do when you get slain in the spirit, right? You spot the landing. Right? Spot the landing. And then I went down. Make sure the catch it. And I laid down. And the first thought in my head as I laid there, I kid you not, the first thought that I had in my head was, how long do I have to lay here before I can get up? Because there's this perfect window of time that you have to explain to the Spirit. Because if you get up too soon, everybody looks at you and they go, no, 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 He did not receive all of those. Why is he getting up? I, he has sinned in his life. So, somebody, somebody come knock him down again, right? But if you get up too late, then once again, just like the last guy that gets prayed for, everybody's mad at you. They're ready to go home. And they're like, why is this guy still laying here? Like, does he have that much sin in his life that he needs to lay here? Can you just dismiss the service? You know, and just, because I'm hungry. I want to go, right? So you got this perfect window where 90% of everybody gets up and you kind of want to get up with everybody else, right? But when your eyes are closed because you're slain in the spirit, you don't know when everybody's getting up. Well, I'm Asian, so I have this amazing ability to squint, and it looks like my eyes are closed anyway. Like, my eyes can be open, but you think they're closed. It's, it's incredible. It's a gift. It's like a, I mean, it's, just, it's an Asian anointing. So I, I, I'm lying there, and I start, I squint. And like, totally, like, nobody, nobody can tell this. And then I look, and I'm looking through, and I'm squinting. See, I'm squinting right now. I do not tell I'm squinting. And I'm, I'm and I'm squinting, and, and I'm like, okay, nobody's moving here. So I, I want to see what's going on on the other side. But you can't just roll over like you're just in bed, right? You gotta be like. <laughs> so I roll over, and I'm squinting. Right? You gotta get all the angles. And, like... and I'm looking, and I do this for a while until people start getting up. And as people get up, I'm like. Ah, yeah. And then I go and I sit down and I'm like, oh, dude, I did it, mission accomplished. And I'm taking it back to my seat. And, uh, and I get there. And I kid you, the, the guy sat, standing next to me, he looks, he's like, man, I was watching you the whole time. And it was so obvious. God was really rocking. <laughs> I was like, wow, what? I got to think my way to that whole thing. But you know, that, that planted a thought in my head. I, it, it was an eye opener. You know, I wonder how much fake stuff we do in church. Come on, say that. That's so fake that when people come looking for a real God, they walk into a church that's doing all kind of fake stuff, and they can't find the real God in all the fake things that we do. Wow. Now, I've had moments, I've had moments 
where somebody comes to pray for me and they get five feet from me and they go like this. And then all of a sudden, the next thing I remember is I'm lying 10 feet from where I was standing and my feet are straight up in the air and I wake up and I'm changed. When it's real, it's real. When it's authentic, it's authentic. But it's about time for the church to stop doing all the fake stuff, thinking we got to make stuff happen to impress people who believe in God. And we ought to let God speak for himself and then stop putting fake stuff in the way of people so they can't recognize a real God. If we're all fake, doing all kind of fake stuff all around, thinking that that's what makes us spiritual, then when a person comes and God really wrecks somebody, they can't recognize it. Because they think we're all fake. And they're right. And there's so many rules we put around church. There's so many things that we do that's so fake. And, and the problem with this is that your perspective drives your reality. Whatever you believe, not what is true, is the way you're going to live. For thousands of years, people believed the earth was flat. It doesn't matter that the earth was always round. What mattered is that they believed the earth was flat. And as long as they believed the earth was flat, every decision they made was based on the idea that the earth was flat. They would never sail beyond the horizon. Why? Because you were afraid that if you sailed to the horizon, you were going to fall off the edge of the earth. So they never ventured farther than what they could see. And, be and because they would never venture farther than what they could see, they could never discover new land. How many new lands are you not allowing God to discover in you because you're afraid to go beyond what you can see? And as long as you try to confine God to what you can see, you'll never discover anything beyond that. You'll never be able to grow. So my whole life is about Mythbusting. That's one of my favorite shows before. It was Mythbusting. And I, I feel like I'm less of a preacher, less of a pastor, than I'm just a, than I'm just a Christian Mythbuster. I'm just a Holy Ghost Mythbuster. Breaking through some of the mythology of church so we can get to the real deal. And, and I'm just a believer in the power of Jesus. That if we just Amen. get through all the fake Amen. stuff and we just give people Jesus, we don't have to do anything else. Come on. Jesus will do everything. Because Jesus is the most powerful force powerful person in the history of the universe if I just introduce him into the mix that's it I preached on Easter last week the champion's here I preached in a Muhammad Ali t-shirt with a championship belt on my soul and I just said hey some of y'all just need to get the idea that Jesus is the champ you got the champ in you that makes you the champ you got to start living like a champ instead of a chump amen wow but I want you to turn in your Bibles today to Matthew chapter 16 Matthew chapter 16, we're going to start at verse 13. Very popular piece of scripture. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm just going to read part of it. Turning your Bible, if you got those uh, page turning Bibles, Stacy is like old school. She likes the page turning Bibles. Oh, yeah. Say hi to my wife, Stacy. Whenever she never gets to travel with me, this is a special thing. Stand up, babe. This is a really special trip for me because my wife almost never gets to travel with me. We have five daughters. And, and so she is like the general of our entire family. Amen. And she's the reason why I'm able to do everything I'm able to do. Right. I'm, I would never be able to travel and do the things that God's called me to do without that. But if you got your Bibles, turn into it. If you got your iPhone, if you got your iPad, you can use that too. Turn to your Bible app. I'm not going to talk about Android because we all know Android is the devil. But if you got, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. God's telling me, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. Jesus came to save Android, it's true. So if you got your Android, if you got your Android, turn to your Bible app and then put it on and then, uh, and then turn to Matthew chapter 16 and maybe at some point with the Bible app open, your Android will get saved today. So, so it'll turn into an iPhone, transform. It's amazing. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. If you're there, I want you to do something really Hawaiian for me. I want you to say, all right. All right. <laughs> all right. Matthew Matthew 16 and 13, it says, When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, Some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others say Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Er, wrong, er, wrong, er, wrong. Then he asked them, But who do you say that I am? I want you to turn to the person next to you, and I want you to say, Who do you say that I am? This is the fundamental question of life. Nothing else matters. 
Nothing else you figure out in life. Nothing else that you learn. Nothing else that you, you receive revelation of. Nothing else mattered in your entire lifetime. From the moment you're born to the moment you die. Except for one thing and one thing only. And this one thing is going to determine your eternity. And eternity is so grand that you can live a, a hundred years on this earth. And when you pass through eternity, that hundred years is like one grain of sand on the beach of eternity. And in this one grain of sand on the beach of eternity, the one thing that is going to determine what beach you spend your, the rest of your existence on that will last forever is this one question. Who do you think Jesus is? If you think he's a great teacher, if you think he's a great prophet, if you think he's a heretic, whatever you think he is, nothing else matters but for you to know who he really is. And this is the fundamental truth of life because Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. The Bible is not the truth. The Bible points you to the truth. The Bible is not the actual word of God. It is a word of God, but it points you to the word of God. Jesus is the word. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. The Bible ain't God. I told you if you're religious, you're going to get it. Get it. Come on. <laughs> No, he's a heretic. No, the Bible is not God. The Bible is scripture. The Bible is inspired by God. The Bible will, will never be false. It's authoritative because it will never contradict God. But the Bible is not God. Knowing scripture doesn't make you a Christian. Knowing the Bible doesn't make you a Christian. Believing in the Bible doesn't make you a Christian. In America, I tend to think that Jesus is no longer God. I, I think that, that in America, the Bible's God. Because we will thump our Bible and quote scripture at people before we ever love them. And Jesus said, I got one commandment. Love each other like God loves you. We can't follow Jesus' commandment, but we can sure tell everybody else that they're not living according to the Ten Commandments. See, something is screwed up here because we have put the Bible above God. Yes. Come on. Come on. Say that again. Wow. So when I say that the Bible ain't God, half the people in the room get really uncomfortable. Because why? Because I'm challenging the fact that you have quietly created an idol in your life. Right. called scripture. And I can prove to you that scripture is not, is not on the same level as Jesus because nobody knew scripture more than the Pharisees in the Bible. They could quote it. They could quote every word of the scripture. They taught it. They were the only ones qualified to teach scripture and they memorized scripture. They knew scripture and they represented scripture. And then God stood in the form of a human being this close to them. They were this close to God in flesh. And knowing all of that scripture did nothing for them. Because they called him a heretic, put him on a tree and killed him. You can know scripture and kill God. Isn't that crazy? Come on. Wow. Isn't that crazy? Because what you believe is what you're going to live. And I want to ask you. Do you know who Jesus is? Now I know what you're going to say. You're going to say to me, yeah, I know who Jesus is. Yeah. Chris, I'm sitting here today. I'm a believer. I know who Jesus is. But do you really know him? Because I thought I knew him. I thought I knew him for 15 years. But it wasn't until I was 15 years old that I realized that the picture of Jesus I had in my head wasn't the real one. See, when I was growing up, I would watch Jesus movies. And, and back in the day, the Jesus movie, the big popular Jesus movie, right, because Passion of the Christ hadn't come out yet, the big Jesus movie was Jesus of Nazareth. How many of you remember Jesus of Nazareth? Right? And then Jesus of Nazareth, I remember that movie. We would watch it all the time. It wasn't really a movie. It was like a mini series, right? It was like 17 hours or however long it was. You know, it was like literally I felt like sometimes as a kid watching Jesus of Nazareth at, at, at our church I grew up in. They would always show it every Easter. Uh, weekend, and I would go watch it, and I felt like I experienced Jesus' three years in ministry, because it felt that long to me, you know, it was so long, but the thing that I remember about Jesus is that, you know, is that Jesus always was depressed, I don't remember him smiling one time in the movie, like, he would always look like he was on the verge of crying, right, and I would be like, why is Jesus on the verge of crying, I figured it out, and I want to explain to you why Jesus was always depressed. Jesus was depressed in Jesus' death. I don't know. Go back and watch it. He was yeah, depressed. He was really depressed. He never smiled. It was crazy. He was always like weeping and stuff. I, I, I know why, okay? 
okay? But, but first of all, Jesus was always a white guy. Jesus was a white dude. Jesus was the one white dude walking around in the Middle East 2,000 years ago. Like somehow everyone else was Jewish, but Jesus was this white dude with blonde hair and blue eyes. Like, he, like that, that should have been the first indicator he was God. He was just, like, that was a miracle, right? And he, was, and he was this blonde-haired white guy. Right? And, and every picture of Jesus that in my head, that whenever somebody said Jesus, because I was so informed by media, by TV, by all those things, this is what I thought Jesus was. That was Jesus to me, my whole life growing up. That guy right there. And Jesus evidently always walked around with his head cocked a little sideways. <laughs> because every uh, painting or picture I've ever seen of Jesus, his head is cocked this way. <laughs> so it must be so, right? The paintings wouldn't lie. They were written on like hundreds of years. They were, they were painted hundreds or maybe even thousands of years before us. So they were closer than, to actually, you know, historical data about Jesus. So evidently, you're the blonde hair, blue-eyed white guy who always had his head cocked as he walked around. Now, I understand why he was so depressed, because first of all, if you walk around like this all, all your life, that means, right, that you must have slept on your pillow wrong, which means you have a really bad crick in your neck. And Jesus must have always had a crick in his neck. He must have always slept wrong, right? But then the Bible said that Jesus had nowhere to lay his head. That's what he said. So that's what? That explains why he had a crick in it. He said, I don't have a place to lay my head. I'll lay my head on rocks. Of course you would have a massive crick in your neck. So you would never smile, right? Yeah. And not only that, Jesus had a pet. He had a pet lamb. And Jesus would always walk around the countryside with a crick in his neck holding a lamb. That would probably be heavy after a while. That would probably be annoying, right? If you're always carrying a lamb around, right, it'll do its lamb stuff, right? Like the food goes in and then other stuff eventually comes out and it would get all over his arm and it would be really hard to really clean it because he can't really look at it because his head has a crick in his neck. So he's really depressed. I would be depressed too. And my view of Jesus was that he was this like, this white dude that was always like, like he had a crick in his neck, right? And then he looks like a wuss. <laughs> like he, he looks like the biggest wimp in the world. Like, do you believe that guy can actually beat death, hell, in the grave? He doesn't even look like he can beat me as like a, a fourth grader. And I was like the, the smallest, nerdiest fourth grader in the world. And I look and go, I can take that guy. He's holding a lamb that has a crick in his neck. <laughs> A week. He's like so calm. It's like he doesn't just he doesn't just turn like one cheek. He turns the second cheek, and then he turns the third cheek, and then he turns the fourth cheek, and he's turning all he does is turn cheek. He gets hit, he takes it, he eats it, just turn the other cheek. And that's the view of Jesus I always had growing up. He was just this weak, wimpy. So as a result, I believe in a weak, wimpy Christianity. Because the version of Jesus you believe in is the version of Christianity you're going to live out. And I want you to think about the version of Christianity you're living out in life right now. Because that is an indicator of the version of Jesus you really believe in. And while we're laughing at this picture, the truth is many of us actually have this view of Jesus. We say you conquer death, hell, and the grave, but everything, every time something comes up in your way, in your path, you give up, you cry, you, you text message your pastors and say, pray for me. I need something to change. I, I can't do this anymore. I'm, I'm ready to give up. And, and it goes back to this flawed view of Jesus that we have. So I want to talk to you for a few minutes. about who I think Jesus is. And I want to help you kind of break through all of the faith so we can get to the real. Let's do it. Come on. <coughs> Who's ready to go with me? Let's do it. Yes. All right. 
See, when I started reading the Bible for myself, I started to realize that Jesus was anything but that guy. <laughs> Jesus wasn't that guy at all. First of all, spoiler alert, he wasn't, he wasn't blonde or blue eyed. He wasn't. Yeah, I know. I know. It was devastating. It was, it was devastating. Not as devastating to me because I'm Asian. So, I mean, I didn't have any, I didn't have a dog in this fight. So, I was cool with it. But, I mean, you know, well, all my white friends, they're like, what? What? Jesus wasn't white. What? I told you, you're going to be so mad at me, right? We're like going to, we're going to like hit up all the other stuff. He wasn't. He was Jewish. And Jesus wasn't a girly looking man. Jesus was born and raised a carpenter. So that dude was probably pretty muscular and ripped. That's just a fact. But when I started reading the Bible, I started to realize, man, Jesus is way cooler than I was taught in Sunday school. He was way better. He's awesome. And there are some stories in the Bible that are so amazing. And this is literally, the, I'm going to talk about three versions of Jesus real quick. And these three versions of Jesus are the versions of Jesus I always think about when somebody says, what would Jesus do for us? I'm like, oh, let me tell you what Jesus would do. And the number one, the first one I want to talk about is table flipping Jesus. Table flipping Jesus is my boy, man. Table flipping Jesus is straight up. And he's a, so table flipping Jesus is, right? The story goes like this. John chapter 2. I'm not going to read it. You can read it. Right? John chapter 2. Jesus goes to the temple to do what they always had to do, which is sacrifice. And he goes into the temple, and the priests in the temple had figured out that people didn't really want to give God their best. That, that to sacrifice... The law said you've got to bring your best. If it's your sheep, you've got to bring your best lamb. If it's a bird, you've got to bring your best bird. If it's your crop, you've got to bring your best crop. And how many of you know human beings, people, right? We don't like to give anybody our best. We want to keep the best for ourselves. Right? That's why it's so hard to talk about offering. Nobody wants to give offering. Why? We don't want to give God our best. We'll give God. We'll tip God like our waiter. We won't actually let get God take our first fruits like the IRS does. And when we won't let God tax us with tithes like, like we give to Uncle Sam and the government, but we tip God with what we got left like a waiter, that tells me that you don't actually see God as your government. You just see him as your waiter waiting on you whenever you need him. Come on. Wow. Yeah. It revealed everything to me about what you think about God in the way you give. Sure, let me take a walk. <laughs> we'll take up another offering at the end. Right. And then like a third building fund offering and then a fourth. Yeah, amen. I'm just kidding. And God tells me to believe in like offering me to them. But the priest figured out people don't like bringing their best. And the priest decided to capitalize on the people's desires and said, we can make a little bit of money off of this. So they would get lambs, they would get livestock, they would get birds and, 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 and crops, and they, and they would have it already there. And then they would say, don't bring your best, keep your best, just come, pay us, and we'll give you something to sacrifice. And the people were like, awesome, awesome. Because I want to keep my lamb. I want to keep my sheep. I want to keep my stuff. I want to give it. I'll pay you to do it for me. And 2,000 years later, that's what we do. We'll say, oh, you're looking for a spouse? Oh, you, you're you looking for the right mate? Hey, sow a seed. Sow $1,000 today, and you'll get peace of mind. You can't buy peace with an offering. <laughs> you, can't, you can't buy the joy of the Lord with an offering. You give to God because he commands it. And Jesus gets in there. And he's just like, whatever happened that day, he decided, I'm done taking it. I am done being that dude. And I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm mad. He's like, I'm, I'm angry. And this is the coolest part about the story. Jesus doesn't just flip out and go ham on everybody. Like, that's what we think he did. He did it. Jesus sits down and thinks about this thing, of what he's about to do. And he goes, hey, Peter, go get me some rope. I need some rope. 
Why, Jesus? Why do you need Rome? Just go get it for me, Peter. I'll wait. I'll wait. He's sitting in the middle of this. Peter goes off. He goes and grabs some rope. Jesus just sitting there. Everybody's kind of smiling at him, kind of looking at him. Are you in line? Oh, no, no, no. You go ahead. You go ahead. Are you sacrificing? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In a little bit, in a little bit. But go, go for it. Go for it. You know, the merchants are looking at him, and they're like, he came in a while ago, but he hasn't come up to any of our tables yet to get a sacrifice, and he doesn't look like he has anything in hand. So, uh, hey, have you been helped yet? Have you been helped? And Jesus is like, oh, oh, oh I'm about to help you in a second. <laughs> I'm about to assist you out the door. So Peter comes back, brings a rope. Jesus is there. And the Bible says that Jesus makes a whip. Read it. It's like, it's so amazing. I love to put myself, when I read the Bible, I like to put myself in it. I don't like to bring the Bible out to where I am. I like to put myself into where it is. And I like to kind of just picture it. Close my eyes and picture what it looked like. What would it look like for Jesus to be sitting there making a whip? To beat down fools in the temple. <laughs> Does it mean I'm slave? Yeah. <laughs> I think that's the coolest thing ever. Jesus, not in a moment of flesh or anger or a lack of self-discipline, makes a decision that he's going to clean the house. <laughs> that he's going to speak for people who don't even know they need to be spoken for. Yeah. He's going to stand up and make things really uncomfortable for people who may not even want it yet. For people who will probably be mad that he did that because now they got to go home. they got to go get a lamb. Now they got to go. But, but he does it because it's right. Amen. Not because it's comfortable. And then he built that, that, that whip. It doesn't even say that he whipped anybody. I don't even know why he made the whip because it doesn't say he whipped anybody. But it does say that he went over and he started flipping tables. And I tell people all the time, I'm tired of walking in the church and seeing paintings of Jesus that look like the white guy with the crick in his neck holding the lamp. I want to go into church and I want to see a painting. I said, somebody paint me a big mural of Jesus being popping, whip up in the air. Flipping over a table like a WWE TLC match. Flipping it over. Merchants on the ground clawing their way out the door screaming. People running all around. And Jesus just in his face just like, get out of it. And I want you to paint that picture for me because I swear I will put it in the foyer of God's house where everybody can see it first and know what church they're walking into. Amen. Amen. Because see... That story of Jesus tells me that the real Jesus is willing to upset my life so that he can reset my direction. Nice. Nice. God, see, this is why we don't like, we would rather go back to the fake Jesus calm because that guy doesn't mess up your life. He doesn't care what you do. Just come to church on Sunday. Do your spiritual duty. I'm not going to upset nothing. But the real Jesus will upset your life to reset your direction. He walked in there not to beat down people. No. He went because he saw an injustice that they had lost their way. And he said, I am going to upset the status quo so that I can reset my move for what it was always intended to be. And I wonder if there are people with the Spirit of God living inside of you that will say, I am willing to upset all of the relationships and the things in my life so that I can begin to reset the direction of everyone around me to Christ. But we don't like that because that puts a demand on me. I've got to speak up. I've got to take a stand. I can't just go along with the cricket in my neck holding the lamb with all my friends when they go to the club. <laughs> See, everything you learn about Jesus, you learn about you. Because my life is no longer my own. I belong to Christ. Amen. So I no longer find my identity in who I am. I find my identity in who he is. 
And in modern Christianity, we've conformed Jesus to the image of us <laughs> instead of conformed ourselves to the image of him. <laughs> Table flipping Jesus. Another version of Jesus, Allah. This might be, this, this is up there from all time. Another version of Jesus, Allah, is Yo Mama Jesus. <laughs> Yo Mama Jesus. Yo Mama Jesus. Yo Mama Jesus is so awesome. Did you know that Jesus is the Yo Mama champ of the universe? <laughs> y'all don't believe me. I know. Some of y'all sitting here like, what's Yo Mama? <laughs> Did you know that there was an epic Yo Mama battle in the Bible? There was. Matthew 23 talks about it. It's so epic. It's so amazing. What happens is, let me set it up for you. So, everybody would always meet in the temple square, in front of the entrance of the temple. It was this big square. And that's where all the teachers of the law, the Pharisees, the schools would, 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 would meet up outside of the synagogue, and they would just hang out. And they would just talk, and they would debate and discourse and all those things. And, and so the Pharisees were the kings of the square. They were the kings of the temple. They owned that place. And what they said ruled. And there was these certain Pharisees like Caiaphas, right, and, and Annas, who were the real bosses, right, of that day. And they would, they would, just, be, they would just be out there in the square, and, what, and everybody would listen to them, right? But then, and then, but then Jesus kind of came along, and Jesus started messing stuff up. Because here's this kind of young guy. He was really young to be a rabbi. He was 33, right? And he's got these disciples. And, you know, forget that picture of the disciples. This is a whole other story for another time. But forget that picture of the disciples as, like, you know, in the Jesus of Nazareth movie, they're all older than Jesus. They're, like, 40, 50 years old. They got beards and all this stuff and everything. But actually, no. Actually, you know, Jesus was a really young rabbi. But even if you were a regular age rabbi, you would, you would uh, call your disciples, and they would be between the ages of 15 and 19 for the most part. So all of Jesus' disciples were young guys. They were teenagers. They were young 20-some-year-olds. You know, historians believe that all the disciples, all 12 disciples, their age range, uh, ages range somewhere between about 15 or 17 years old and about 29 to 31. And that Peter was probably at the older end of that, but James and John were about 15 to 17 years old. That's amazing. Kind of blows up that kind of mythology stuff we have, right? So Jesus would always make them mad because he would always show up. And they would get you know, so annoyed. You can read in the Bible over and over again. They, the Pharisees would challenge Jesus. They would challenge him. Jesus would show up and they'd step up and they'd be like asking him questions, challenging him. And Jesus would give them parables, tell them stories and everything. But one day, Matthew 23, this is about you know a, a week or so before he dies. Jesus is like, yo, that's it. I'm done with you. And in my mind, it sets up a little bit like this. The Pharisees are all chilling, they're all sitting there, and they're talking, and they're used to bloviating and everybody listening to them. So they're like, you know, thus says the Lord God Almighty. You know, and, all, and then everybody's listening. And then Jesus comes with his posse, right? With his disciples, and they come. They roll up. Right? And you know, if you've ever been to a party, where somebody shows up you didn't invite, it gets real uncomfortable real quick. <laughs> y'all, y'all can laugh. I know y'all been to some parties. Y'all, y'all have church in a place that I think like any second now like a rave might break out. Like, <laughs> so I know that y'all been to some parties. Y'all, y'all know what I'm talking about. Y'all, y'all holy. Y'all ain't that holy. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, like, the guy rolls up, right? The guy comes in, and everybody's like. Who invited him? Did you, did, you come, did you text him back? No, 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 no. How do you know, right? And everybody is real comfortable. And so they do what they always do. They challenge Jesus. But this time Jesus is like, no, that ain't going to happen. So Jesus rolls up. And then all of a sudden everything just kind of goes quiet. And then like the music hits, right? That violin is like. Showdown. Tumbleweed. And Matthew steps up, right? Because he was a tax collector. Everybody hated him. Everybody hated him. He steps up, so he doesn't care what anybody says. And he says, Yo! DJ! Hit my music! <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, 
children of all ages, get ready. Because it's about to go down in Jerusalem. Everybody get up. Everybody get up. Everybody get up. And wave your hand in the air. Wave your hand in the air. In this corner. Matthew's like, and in this corner, we got the new guy, fresh out of Nazareth, son of a carpenter. He's still got dark hair because the white hasn't hit yet. He's got the worst school in the world, full of the worst students. I don't even know where he found them, but here he's cornering the challenger, Jesus of Nazareth. You go first. Time is like, I got it. I got it. I got it. I can't believe after all this time of throwing down challenges, Jesus, you finally fell for it. I'm gonna crush him right now. He's going down. Yo, Jesus! Your mama's so ratchet. She couldn't figure out which guy. She got pregnant by so she could say it was God. Everybody's like, oh. Jesus like, oh, I can't believe you're talking about my mama like that. I can't believe you're talking about my mama like that. Peter, can you believe you're talking about my mama like that? Nobody talks about my mama like that. All right, all right. That's it. That's it. Nobody talks about my mama. No kindness. No mama's so dumb. She took. And then all the other Pharisees are like, yo, Jesus came to play. Yo, he's not like these other chumps out here that ain't got nothing. Like, he's got it. Yeah, you, are you ready, Captain? You, you need me to jump in? Captain's like, no, 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 no. I got, I got this. I got this. I got this. I got this. Yo, yo, calm down. Calm down. All right. Yo, Jesus. Yo, Jesus. Yo, mama is so ugly. The only person she could get to give her a child was not that nobody else would give her. That's messed up. That's messed up. She's like, oh, did he just go back to the same joke that he used before? Are you running out of stuff, God? You ain't got nothing. You ain't got nothing else. And then it's like, dude, oh, Jesus, you got it. You got it. You're like, yeah, I got it. I got it. I got it. All right. All right. I'm going to end it right here. I'm going to end it. I'm going to end you, Caiaphas, right here. Yo, Caiaphas. Yo, mama's so fat. She stepped into the doorway of salvation. And she can't let nobody else in. Nor can she enter in either. Because she can't fit. God can fit her through his door. Both like, oh, yeah, she said that, by the way. Go read Matthew 23 yesterday. And they're like, oh, oh. And then Matthew's like, oh. And all people are like, who? Who's the winner? Who's the winner? Matthew's like, there's no winner. And you, champion of your mama, Jesus. And the whole crowd goes, yeah. That's my theory about why Caiaphas fought so hard to kill Jesus like a week later. Because Jesus took his crown. Right? 
I'm just kidding, but I love your mama Jesus. You know why? Your mama Jesus is willing to take on all comers. The Pharisees ruled the land. They weren't just the religious leaders and the pastors like we, we would say today. They were actually the government. They made the laws. They enforced the laws. They passed judgment on the laws. So you never crossed the Pharisees. It, it was just the way that it went. And for centuries, it was just the way that it went. You listened to them. Even if what they said was wrong, even if what they did to you was wrong, even if what, what they, they talked about you was wrong, you just had to take it. They, they brought a woman to Jesus, threw her at his feet, and said, we're going to stone her for adultery. And you know who the only person that didn't get to make the case before Jesus? It was the woman. She wasn't allowed to speak out. She's about to lose her life and before Jesus, and she can't say anything about it. She's been trained that you couldn't take them on. But Jesus... Never it was intimidated by the powers that be. Jesus was never, Jesus would always take them on. And when you have Jesus inside of you, when you understand that that's the real Jesus, and that Jesus lives inside of you, then you would realize that you don't just have to take it in your life. You don't have to take it because that's what your parents said you would never be. You, can, you don't have to take it because everyone around you rejects you. You don't have to take it because you've made some bad decisions in life. And now you're living with those consequences. You don't have to take it because of regret. You don't have to take it because you've always dealt with depression. You don't have to take it just because you don't have money. You don't have to take it in life. You can stand up to the power that be. And you can believe everything Jesus said about you and what you can do. Because the same Jesus that stood up to the powers that be 2,000 years ago lives in you and you can stand up to. Amen. Some of y'all need to get your mama on your life. Some of y'all need to get your mama on your devil. The last one I want to talk about, he's the best one. He's bully beat down Jesus. <laughs> bully beat down Jesus. He's very closely tied. It's like a progression, right? Table flipping Jesus dealt with the stuff. He flipped over tables. He upset chairs. But then your mama Jesus, once he got the stuff out of the way, he stepped up to him himself, looked him in the eye. But sometimes words just aren't enough. That's why it's not enough for you to confess about scripture if you have no intention of actually following through. Come on. You can't keep saying to yourself every day, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, when every time you come across an obstacle, you whip out, fall on the ground, start crying. Oh, come on. Mm. Right. Nothing you confess means anything. James says, faith without works is dead. It doesn't matter what you say you believe. If you don't follow through on it, it means nothing. And Jesus realized this. It's not enough to step up to the Pharisees. It's not enough to turn over tables. So Jesus took it a step further. But I love how the way Jesus beat down the bullies was he didn't step up to them by force. He let the bullies beat him down. Because he was tired of watching the bullies beat you down. So he said, I'm going to let you beat me down in their place. And a week ago, we celebrated Good Friday and Easter, where we celebrate what Jesus did to us on a cross. It's amazing to me that Jesus would subject himself to something like that, because if there's anybody in the universe that didn't have to, it was him. In fact, he would make statements like, if I really wanted to, I should send out angels right now to rescue me, and it would be good. He told Pontius Pilate, if my kingdom was of this earth, my followers would rise up and rescue me. He tells the Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But nonetheless, not my will, but yours be done. I'm going to subject myself to it. He says, no one takes my life, but I give it willingly. Amen. He would make these statements that let you know he didn't have to do this. It wasn't the devil that killed him. Jesus killed him. <laughs> that messes up our theology, right? <laughs> he says, nobody kills me. I'm giving my life. And he let the bullies beat him down. I can never fathom what it would feel like 
For a God who is God, by definition, cannot have pain inflicted on him, cannot be hurt. What would it feel like for that first lash of leather knotted with pieces of glass, bone, and metal to rip into his flesh and to see him snap it out and as it rips down his body, a God who cannot feel pain feels pain for the first time. I can't imagine what it would feel like to me, but I'm human. I have a reference for pain. I've had my foot cut open. I, I, I've, had, I, I've been sliced before. I know that pain, and still that pain is unthinkable to me. How much more unthinkable to a God who doesn't have a frame of reference like that because he's gone? What would it feel like for those first nails to go through his wrist? What would it feel like for his feet <coughs> to have nails driven through them. Feet that form the mountains. To have nails through them. Hands that form the everything in the world. Form man. And the very creation that his hands form now drive nails through them. What would it feel like to hang on that tree and not be able to breathe. The power of crucifixion wasn't in all the nails and all the pain. The, how crucifixion, crucifixion killed you and why it was such a terrible way to die is because it would slowly suck the breath from you until you couldn't breathe anymore. You would have to pull yourself up and then and pull on those nails that you're hanging by and pull yourself up by those nails and take a breath and you go back down. And at some point you start to lose energy and lose power and slowly you could pull yourself up less and less and less until finally you wouldn't be able to breathe. What would it feel like for the God who breathed life into every living being not being able to find breath himself? See, we live in a world that teaches you you defeat force by force. So when we Look at the issues of our day. We look at the things that are rising up against, against what we believe is our, is our right as, as believers. We see the homosexual movement. We see all these different movements that rise up. And we think that our job is to fight force with force. But Jesus said, if you live by the sword, and we're dying by the sword because we're throwing the word of God around. You know, my wife preached at a conference uh, last year. She spoke one of the best words I've ever heard in my life. You should hear her preach. She preached, she preached on, 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 on Peter cutting dude's, uh, dude's ear off when they were arresting Jesus. And Jesus had taken ear, put it back on. And she, she preached on how there's nothing more dangerous in this world than an immature believer think they're defending Jesus with the word. And all they're doing is cutting off the ear of people so they can't hear it. And that's what we're doing. We're fighting force with force. But what if we would just lay down our lives and do the one thing Jesus said to do, to love like he loved? And what if we were to love people? into the kingdom of God. Yeah. Not trying to punch people into the kingdom of God. Yes. Because we'll never defeat the enemy using the enemy's tactics. Yeah. And Jesus knew this. And so he gets on the cross and at the very end, in his last breath, he says, it is finished. And I bet you in that moment, the devil looked and said, he just gave up. He just, he, he just said it's finished because on the surface, what it looked like, he took his last breath and then he died. And for the enemy, for Satan, Jesus taking his last breath and dying, that's what he was trying to do the whole time. So when Jesus says it is finished and he dies, he, the, the enemy takes that as an admission of defeat. But the thing is, when Jesus tells us to take communion, he says this bread, you eat it. In remembrance of my body, which was broken for you. Now, it's interesting that he says it that way because uh, you would think that he would say, I want you to eat this in remembrance of me because I died for you. But he doesn't. He says, I want you to remember my body, which was broken for you. And when you drink the cup, I want you to drink the cup that remembers my blood. He talks about his body. He talks about his blood. It's really interesting that he tells you to do it that way. He doesn't say, remember me. Remember remember that, that, that I'm God, that I came down and died for you. He said, remember my body and my blood. Why would he tell us to only remember his body and his blood? Why would he tell us to remember his sacrifices, his, to remember his, his spirit going, going down into hell and getting the death, the, the key to You know why he does it? Because the thing is, what the enemy didn't know is that when he killed Jesus' body, he was like an egg cracking open. And you could break his body. You could kill his body. But you can't kill God. No. Yeah. And although his body dies. 
His body took the last breath. All it did, instead of killing God, it just released him into his destiny. Sometimes, sometimes your destiny is going to be released in the thing you don't want to do most. Jesus begged his father not to let his body be broken, but he did. And all it did, like an egg cracking open, is it released everything on the inside. And Jesus said, oh, you did, you did what you shouldn't have done. You just broke me open. It's so crazy that every time Jesus took bread, he broke it and multiplied. Every time in the Bible, you read in the Bible, when Jesus would, would take bread, and, and he says, I'm the bread of life, he would break it and it would multiply. Feeding of the 5,000, it, it didn't matter what it was. And then he broke the bread and he gave it to his disciples. He broke the bread on the road to Emmaus after he rose up. He breaks the bread. It, it doesn't matter if it turned from one to two or if it turned from one to, to, to 5,000. It doesn't matter. But it just it would multiply. You would break it open. And Jesus, the bread of life, was broken open on the cross and it released his destiny. And he went down and he said, all you did was make me more powerful than you could ever imagine. And now I can't be beaten. I can't be killed. And when Jesus comes out of the grave, the first thing he does, he walks out of the walls of the tomb. He didn't walk out the door. The Bible says that the angel moved the, the, the door of the tomb to show the women that Jesus was already gone. Jesus had already left before the door had ever been removed, that big stone. Jesus doesn't need any angel's help once he comes back from the cross. He is glorified. He is the name above all names. He's the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He has no more work to be done. So when he said he was finished, he wasn't saying that he was finished. He was saying, devil, you're finished. Amen. And now, the devil, 2,000 years later, in your life, he's already finished. He knows he's finished. The only thing he can do in your life is try to convince you that he still has power. But he doesn't. He, for 2,000 years, he is, he is a man walking with no power, no ability to actually do anything in your life except what you allow him to. Because 2,000 years ago, Jesus beat down the bully, put him under his feet, took all of his power, all of his championship belt, all of his crown, all of your lives, and he placed it in his hands. And he said, everyone in my hand, no one can take away. 